Uh, I am Nees Wolterbeek, I'm 25 years old and I'm living in the city here in uh, Nijmegen. Uh, here I study learning and development uh, in organizations at the University of Applied Sciences in uh, Arnhem, Nijmegen. It's a four year uh, bachelor program. And after my studies, I would like to continue in the learning and development field. Um, in short, the goal of this interview is to gain uh, more insight um, with effective measures. Um, which effective measures organizations can take to optimize the transfer uh, of learning interventions, uh, especially from your instructional design perspective uh, and experience? Uh, because I believe there are like several uh, differences in how you can approach transfer. Um, so, uh, in other words, um, to better transfer the knowledge gained from the learning intervention to the learner's workplace. Um, Guy, can you um, introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, thank you. My, so my name is Guy Wallace. I'm 71 years old and I've recently retired, but I've been in the learning and development profession since back in 1979 when it was more uh, familiarly called uh, training and development. But uh, I was started off working for a lumber company as a program developer, and then I moved to Motorola's headquarters, and I was a, a training project supervisor there, serving manufacturing materials and purchasing functions throughout uh, all of North America. And uh, then I became a consultant in uh, the late part of 1982, and I've worked predominantly with large corporations, Fortune 50 and 100 size companies, some government agencies, um, and uh, some smaller concerns. And my work has taken me all across uh, America uh, to several locations in Canada. I've worked in England. I've worked in Germany. I've worked in the Netherlands. I've spent quite a bit of time in Hilversum. And the, uh, that area, that's where my client was located. It was an American company, and that was their international uh, organization. But uh, I'm happy uh, to uh, lend my two cents worth to your efforts. Thank you very much. Um, are you ready for the uh, first questions? All right. Um, how would you define uh, the concept of transfer in, uh, in your own words? Well, a transfer is taking people who lack awareness, knowledge, and skills to some predefined uh, level of awareness, knowledge, or skills. And beyond simple skills, it could go into something more complex, as such as the ability to perform back on the job. So transfer is really taking people from some learning experience formal or informal using various uh, media and modes uh, and enabling them to achieve some level of performance competence back on the job. And by performance competence, I mean the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And that will lead to either good outcomes or if you don't meet those stakeholder requirements, that's an undesirable outcome. Okay, thank you uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the context of the question of the, about learning, uh, about transfer. Um, so uh, which factors do you believe um, have a lot of significant influence on the success of uh, learning transfer? Yeah, so I think it all starts with the learning content itself and the information and demonstration and application exercises, uh, practice with feedback. If that's not authentic, if we don't really understand what the learner, who is really a performer back on the job, if we don't understand what their job tasks are and what they're trying to produce and what the standards or requirements are for both the outputs and the tasks, um, we're going to miss the boat. We will affect a transfer because we'll be expecting people to learn something and figure out how to apply it. And um, so it, I think it all starts with our analysis or discovery efforts 
in terms of what are people supposed to do, what are they supposed to produce, and how is all of that measured? If we don't start with that, then we're never really going to make uh, transfer as successful as it could be. But there's other factors as well. Then there's so if we understand the terminal performance goals, mm -hmm. then it then it comes down to how did we design some learning intervention to uh, take people from where they are to where we want them to be awareness, knowledge, or skill-wise. And people may come into the learning experience with different prior knowledge from previous education and or experience. And so they're not all at the same place most of the time, it, that mm -hmm. can happen. But uh, then we need to get them to some <laughs> predefined state of awareness, knowledge, and skill. And so our design is really critical in how we do that. So if we're taking a, a bunch of learners who have a lot of experience and we're going to give them a little bit of knowledge on this new uh, feature or function or this new procedure, they're starting way ahead of the game than somebody who knows nothing at all. And so our design has to accommodate that variance in the learners themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Then... The, another issue that affects transfer is when people learn something and then go back to the job, are they going to be encouraged to apply what they've learned or are they going to be discouraged or uh, prohibited from doing what they've done? And back when I first started back in 1979, the little story that I was told was that somebody learned something, they go back to the job and the supervisor says, I don't understand what you're doing. Do it my way. And so then every all the investment in the instruction, in the training, in the learning is for naught. And it, it, it simply becomes a wasted effort uh, with a nil or negative return on investment because the people back on the job, the supervisor or the peers that one might be working with, they might inhibit uh, or encourage the learner, the performer to do it the old way, because that's the way we've always done it. We all understand that. And if guy comes back from some learning experience and wants to try some newfangled way of doing something, that may be uncomfortable for them. The supervisor may say, I don't know how to manage that. I don't understand that. And so one of the things that we really need to look at is not just the learning context, but the performance context and look for potential barriers and then work with our clients and stakeholders about what they're going to do about that because we are powerless. It's our client and stakeholders who, who typically are in the higher levels of the chain of command of our learners. And we're doing this learning effort, this training or instructional effort for the benefits of the learner so they can be successful working back on the job. That makes that organization more successful. So really, we need to work with the managers to help identify the barriers and create strategies and tactics for them because they own that performance context and the performers. And if they want to stop people from becoming barriers, that's up to them. There's very little that anybody in a learning and development organization can do. We can warn people, we can give them a heads up about what they're likely to face. We can talk about strategies and tactics, but if supervisors are universally going to stop what was learned from being applied on the job, then we are helpless as our learners are as well. So uh, would you say like um, supervisors are playing like a really big role in uh, learning transfer? Yes. All right. Yes, I had a client at uh, Eli Lilly who insisted that all of their vendors that produced learning content for a particular target audience also created something for the supervisor. That was their requirement because they understood that the supervisor is key in leveraging new knowledge and skills being applied successfully back on the job. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really understand that. Um, so uh, the manager is playing like a really big role in influencing transfer and um, how does like the learning environment uh, influence that factor as well? 
Well, what the what the research shows, and I'm not a researcher, so I've I've learned a lot of things here, mm-hmm. and I speak it and and think about it and talk about it in a layman's uh, a manner. But but the closer that the learning environment replicates the job environment, the more successful transfer will be. Back in the early 80s, when I became a consultant, I was a, a, at some client's location, and they wanted to show uh, me and my business partner uh, a simulation that had been set up. And it was a simulation for jet aircraft pilots, uh, jet fighter pilots. And they had three different simulators if you will. One was kind of simple, and I'm going to make the numbers up because I don't recall this exactly, but maybe there were 50 lights uh, flashing on and off and buttons that push and switches to flip on and off and things like that. And that was the first level. Then they tripled that number of things in the second simulation. And then the third simulation was the full-blown cockpit of an aircraft. And so they eased people, if you will, from the shallow end of the pool into the neck level of water. And then you were all of a sudden in the deep end where where you had to deal with the full reality. So we eased people into that. And I think that the, the learning environment needs to take people and think about their psychological safety and their physical safety and ease them into the complexity that is the job. We can't teach something in some simplified manner and expect people to learn it well enough and then go out to a complex situation and perform. We have to take people. And so when I do, when I design uh, practice exercises and I'm forewarning my clients and stakeholders of what I'm going to do unless they stop me, I would tell them I'm going to make the first exercise easy peasy, simple. I'm going to make the next one difficult. I'm going to make the next one darn difficult. And the next one is going to be from Hades, from hell. It's going to be the worst case scenario because that's what we need to provide people to be able to do. My clients either like that or they didn't like that. And most all of the time, they loved it. They didn't just like it because they knew that that's what we're really trying to do is prepare people for their jobs. And we can't treat things simply. Uh, Because I would have warned them that, you know, one and done exercises is not sufficient. It's hardly ever sufficient unless the target audience knows almost everything already. And then we just give them a little bit and then they apply it one time and that's good and we're good to go. So we have to understand who the learners are and where they're starting from and where we're trying to get them to. Now, it may be the case that we want to have a learning experience that takes people just to the easy peasy and the difficult. And then there may be a different learning experience that gives them the knowledge and skills that they need in order to be able to perform in a darn difficult situation. And then maybe there's a third that deals with the hellacious nature of the work whenever the worst case scenario might appear. So how we design that, there's a lot of things that it depends on. It depends on the learners. It depends on what's to be learned. It depends on the variability in the performance because not all performance is rote, where you do the same thing all the time. You, the learner may have to respond to variances in the work environment mm-hmm. that could change. Because if you're going to be working at the top of a telephone pole in a hot and sunny day, or a cool and mild day, or a rainy day, or a day where it's snowing and sleeting and 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 freezing cold, that's different. And how we teach people, how we prepare people. Uh, so that they learn really how to perform in those different varied contexts. Well, that's critical. And that that needs to be then reflected back in the learning environment itself. You want to basically, the ideal thing is to learn on the job. That's yeah. just not scalable. So so if we can't have people learning on the job because of safety reasons or, or whatever the, the reason we wouldn't want to do that, we have to take them out of that and we need to try to make that environment as similar as we possibly can. It doesn't have to be perfectly similar. And the testing will later on will tell us whether we we got it good enough uh, and that the learning context was close enough to the performance context that it was easy for people to learn in one context and then take it to the other. 
Okay, so so um, basically, um, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? Uh, but so basically, just e-learning isn't enough to teach novice people uh, expert things, actually. Yeah, normally that's tr I think that's generally true. Again, yeah. it depends on. So who's the learner? Did they have some job that were close in close proximity to this new job? And that's what they're trying to learn. And they've seen it before. They've participated in it before. Not doing your job, but doing their job. So so it, it always depends. And so sometimes e-learning can give the learner what they need. If, if you're working at a desk and you're uh, reviewing and approving or rejecting loan applications, well, that's easy to replicate in a training sense, whether you're doing that at home or in some classroom with rows of tables and computers. So, so what we, we don't have to replicate, you know, the exactness of the performance context. It's just got to be close enough. And the only way to tell for sure whether it was close enough is what I call pilot testing. It's the first delivery. It's to say, okay, mm -hmm. well, let's let's try this out uh, at, just as if it were the very a real learning experience, and and try to evaluate it uh, in process and at the end as to whether the learner successfully mastered the learning objectives, which re should reflect the performance objectives back on the job. But so e-learning. It's it's limited in some things that it, it can do and can't do. It can't replicate easily the uh, sensation of being up at the top of a telephone pole in the sleet and rain trying to figure something out um, when it's you know dark and stuff. so so. But we can prepare people with the awareness, knowledge, and skills that they need, and then put them into some simulated environment where it replicates close enough because if that's what's really truly tricky and that's where people get hung up and where mistakes are then we really have to go that far um, there's all sorts of immersive learning technologies that are coming and are constantly involving where we might be successful in replicating that and so, so e-learning depending on what you see e-learning to be or not be mm -hmm. you know it can be a big part of that so they have to um, apply it after they go through uh, e-learning. Uh, well, I think so, and you can do that within an e-learning module, if you will, or you can do that separate. But it's a continue. It's a chain of events, learning events. Learning is an event. Yeah, it's a chain of events, actually, or yeah. experiences, or whatever you want to call those things. But but e-learning can play a, a large part of that. But sometimes it it may not be sufficient, and you have to take do something in addition to some e-learning uh, experience. OK, all right. Um, so how does the content of the structure, not not per se really early, but in, in general, uh, of the instructional design contribute to uh, transfer? Well, again, I think that's really critical. So what I learned taught by others back in 1979 uh, and I've uh, had to evolve my own methodology, if you will, my own adaptation of Addy as a consultant because I had to plan and price and then manage projects. But so when I get to the design step, I have analysis data that tells me what are the tasks, what are the outputs, what are the requirements for both, what are the enabling knowledge and skills, uh, and about the target audience, what, is, what do they already know? What don't they know? Or what do some of them know and others don't? And so I need to understand that target audience fairly well. Um, but then when I start uh, designing, I start with performance objectives mm -hmm. and articulate those. And then that leads me to articulate what the learning objectives are. Mm -hmm. And then I design the final test, which is simply, an application exercise, a practice with feedback, that's a test. Yeah. Or we don't call it a test because people don't like testing. I've had many clients who don't like testing, so we don't do testing. But we do practice with, with feedback. And af after designing the application exercises, I might design a demonstration 
so that people can see what it is we want them to be doing when they get into the application exercise. And that should look pretty much like the real work that people will be doing in the future. Now, if the audience uh, are a bunch of incumbents and they've already know what the work looks like, then they may not need a demonstration. But if part of the audience uh, doesn't isn't familiar with it, they just took the job and they've not seen the job, they've not worked cl in close proximity to that, then we need to maybe give them a demonstration. So we design things, application, demonstration, and then information. And we can take the extraneous in information, the extraneous content out, eliminate that extraneous content and ensure that we have the essential content, the information people need, so that the demonstration makes sense and so they can be successful in the application. So we backward design pretty much like we do backward analysis, we begin with the end in mind. Well, what's the output? What do the stakeholders want? Oh, what tasks do you need? Oh, what knowledge and skills do you need? Well, we design the application, then the demonstration, then the information necessary so that the learner can be successful. And then we provide that generally, not always, but generally we give people information, we show them a demonstration, and we say, now you do it too in the application exercise. And there we can give corrective, uh, feedback and reinforcing feedback so that guy can be told, guy, you're doing this right, but this on these other aspects, you need to change. You need to do it differently. Now do it again. So we take guy through a, a succession of application exercise because most of the time, one is not sufficient to really building the capabilities, the competence and the confidence that people need to go back to the job and then apply what they've learned. Okay. So um, uh, I mentioned you you noticed um, you mentioned a lot um, uh, feedback um, sometimes. So can you tell me a little bit more why uh, feedback is important or direct feedback or? Yeah. So I, so feedback is really kind of critical because if I try something. I could mistakenly think that I nailed it. I got it perfect, you know, and maybe that's not the case. Um, and I need to be given feedback on reinforcing feedback to say when I did A and B, that was good. But when I did C and D, that we need to work on that. And here's exactly the specifics of that. Um, and what I was taught a long time ago was that uh, ideally feedback needs to be given not immediately after I've done something, I've tried it, but immediately before I try it again. So if I'm gonna have a chain of practice exercises, I should be given the feedback on how well I did in the first one just before my second opportunity to do it again. Because if I was given the feedback, this is what I was told, if I was given the feedback immediately after, and then I had to wait before my second practice exercise, I might dismiss all the feedback. I might say, okay, yeah, that I, I think I did pretty good. And I could dismiss the feedback that I've gotten. So the instructor or trainer or coach or supervisor back on the job can say, guy, now remember you did A and B really well. So do that just like you did before. But when you get to C and D, those steps, you're gonna have to do C a little bit differently, remember? So you really need to focus on that and you need to do D a little bit differently. And okay, let's try it again. And so now that the feedback is fresh in my mind, I should go and do it. So I've had people tell me that we should give the feedback immediately after and then reinforce that feedback before the second time. And I think that that's what I would agree with because people wanna know how they did. And if you don't tell them until later, well, then they could forget exactly what they, so you want it to be fresh in their mind what they just did in the practice exercise, give them the feedback, but then make sure you give it to them again and they have a chance to ask any questions about the C and D step and exactly. So if I do, and so that they are clear on how they need to change this next time around. Um, the whole issue of practice uh, and providing feedback is something that I think l and has struggled with since way before I got into the business. That's because it takes more time. It takes a lot of time. And too many of our clients and too many of our practicing peers in the L&D are used to the educational model 
or we tell people things, we teach them things, we ask them to memorize things, we give them a test, a knowledge test, mm -hmm. but since we don't know how they're going to apply it in any real world, we can't ask them to practice that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's unique about learning in an enterprise context versus an educational context is that we can figure out why guy needs to learn something. What's he going to apply it in? What tasks, what outputs? And maybe it's more than one, and maybe it varies from one to another. And we've got to take all of that into consideration when we're providing Guy with a learning experience that's to pre prepare him to be successful back on the job. OK. Um, uh, so the next question uh, is, um, uh, first of all, thank you for your explanation. It's uh, very clear. <laughs> um, so uh, what are the um, common external and internal factors um, that might hinder or accelerate uh, transfer of learning? Well, again, it goes back to, was there an adequate analysis or discovery effort that really pinned down what are the tasks, what are the outputs, and how can you tell good ones from bad ones? You know, what are the stakeholder requirements? It's one thing for the downstream customer to be happy, but if the regulators aren't happy, well, that's no good. It doesn't matter that the customer is happy. The customer is not king, despite the, the phrases about the customer being yeah. king, but the regulators could say, well, I don't care about the customer, what they say, I'm gonna shut you down. I'm gonna fine you. I'm gonna throw the executives in jail. I don't care if your customer is happy. So we need to understand that full context and and understand where people are on the learning and performance curves. What do they already know? What don't they know? What can they do? What don't can't they do? And so, then go from there. And so that's really critical. But again, then it goes to design and did I develop it? Uh, did I test it out before releasing it to the world? Have I un, uh, discovered or uncovered some of the potential barriers back out on the job, out of the learning experience? And that context, mm -hmm. and it, it, have I accounted for that? Have I am I working in collaboration with my clients and stakeholders to address those issues too? Because if this project was worth starting and bringing to completion, then it's probably well worth it to look at what is the issue with transfer, um, and what are the potential barriers. And how can we make sure that we address those, that we minimize or eliminate those barriers? And I've been in meetings with clients where I say, well, this is on you, not on me. I can create the best instruction in the world and we can have everybody take it. And when people get to the jobs, the bosses can stop it. Well, I'm sorry, but that's on you, Mr. and Miss Stakeholder. That's mm -hmm. your people. You need to tell people that you expect it that you're going to inspect it and that you're going to provide consequences. You're going to provide positive consequences when everybody embraces this and tries it, even if it's hard and difficult and struggle, but, but, and you're going to provide negative consequences for those who aren't playing ball, who aren't embracing this, because if it's worthy for you to invest in the learning of people, then you need to invest in the transfer and then maintenance of the new behaviors, maintenance of the new performance. Because what, what is often found is that you can have successful transfer because you go out there and inspect it. Yeah, everybody's doing it. But then six months later, everybody's taking shortcuts and they're, they're, making, they're causing issues because we let them backslide. And that again is on managers who need to hold supervisors and their teams accountable for applying new procedures, new processes, using new tools, new ways of thinking. You know, that's that that adherence to the local standards are what managers are to be doing. So sometimes we need to really address their needs because if they don't know this newfangled thing that you're going to teach guy, then they are at a loss. And we've done a disservice to our clients and their people when we don't prepare all of the people involved. Maybe we need something for the supervisor 
And if I'm working with a team, maybe we need something for all the other team members, somebody from finance, somebody from sales, somebody from manufacturing. So maybe they need to know that guy's doing something differently because this is what we've been taught. This is the new official procedure and guy's going to do it differently. And we need to help prepare everybody else as part of the collaborative efforts that most work is in the modern enterprises. Okay. So, so actually the, um, the analysis of the um, structural design process is very important and to involve uh, the correct uh, stakeholders. Yes, I, I think that from the very beginning, in my model, when I changed Addy, when I made my adaptation of Addy, mm -hmm. I put a phase on the front end, project planning and kickoff. At the very beginning of that is my intake process. Somebody has a request. I need to understand that request. I need to understand what my, and then I need to plan my effort. So who am I going to talk to? Who am I going to interview? Who might I observe? What documents should I review? Um, am I going to bring together a focus group of master performers and other subject matter experts to do this work? Or am I going to have to go out and do individual interviews and individual observations? Mm -hmm. Where do I go? I might pick the wrong place. I had a project at Motorola back in 1981 where uh, my, my tendency was to put the names of the people that helped me on my project, put their name on the front cover. I had distributed 20 some binders around the room. This was 1981, so we used three mm -hmm. room binders. Yeah. But my client, the head manufacturing person, looked at the front of that and threw the binder across the room in front of everybody. I had worked with the wrong people, people that I used to call the friends of training. They were always available. They were always willing to help out, but they had zero credibility or less than zero credibility with my clients. And so I learned then and there to always, I wouldn't go interview or observe anybody or go anywhere until my clients told me that's where they wanted me to go. Because mm -hmm. if I brought back data, information, that they didn't agree with, I needed them to have some ownership that, well, these are the people that you told me to interview and this is what they said. Now, either they don't know what they're talking about, which means you didn't, you pointed me to the wrong resources, but, or, or, you know, that's an issue you need to take up with them because they're out there in the real world doing this. This is their perspective. And if five out of five people said the same thing, well then, Maybe you don't agree because you don't understand what's going on and, and, and what we're looking at. And yeah. so this is part of that collaborative effort with the stakeholders and the clients to make sure that, you know, we do that analysis adequately. We, we That the data that we bring back is going to be not only valid, but credible. Because we can bring back valid data that's not credible with our clients. And that's on us for not having uh, constructed a project, an effort, and planned it to really get data from sources that are believable. Okay, so um, uh, I've, uh, the next four questions are a little bit more specific. So um, I'm just going to ask them and you have to see if you're able to. Okay. Um, and then we will, uh, I will go to the ending of this uh, interview um, and questions with interview. Um, so uh, how can learners understanding be amplified to apply the knowledge in their uh, workplace? How can the learners, how can we affect the learners? Well, I think that they need to have confidence that what they're learning is real and authentic. And it, it does reflect what the job requires. So if we are dealing with new hires, people that are brand new to the job, haven't done the job before, for, for a classic example for this is people who are gonna be put into a call center and they may not have sat at the, in the desks and the chairs and with the headsets on, and they may not have done that yet. And they go to the first thing they do is they go off to some classroom and they're taught all these things. Well, they may not, really appreciate you know what is easy and what is difficult and what is really 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 hard um, because they've not been there and done that 
So somehow we have to orient them, provide them with the advanced organizer that helps them understand that context. And maybe the, you know, in the first morning of the first day, they go do a tour and listen in on people talking to the people other, you know, and so we need to maybe consider that or just do a video of it and show them. But being there and, and really, you know, being able to debrief as somebody who's just taken a call with a difficult customer or whatever, maybe that's helpful to, for people to really appreciate that, oh, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not just taking a call. It's dealing with people who are angry. And so how do you yeah. know? And so so we need to help people understand that real world if they don't already. So that I, I hope that answers your question. OK, yes, for sure. For sure. Um, so and, uh, the next question is um, for uh, remembering. So what uh, measures can ensure a person recall uh, information from a training session? Yeah, so I think that uh, we can we can teach people things that they need to memorize. But in my experience, we too often try to force people to memorize things that they didn't really need to memorize. Mm -hmm. There may be uh, reference materials, job aids, uh, performance support out there on the job that they're going to use and look it up. And, and so we've got to be careful that we don't force people to memorize things that they didn't really have to because memories are fragile, um, they're limited. And we, if we really need people to memorize things, we need to understand, well, if, if we get guy to memorize this in a learning experience, and then he goes out to the job and he uses it every day, all day long, it's going to stick with him. But if we're going to teach him things that he needs to memorize, that he's going to use every once in a while, and it could be weeks or months in between uses, he's going to forget it. And so we've got to use spaced learning then, reinforcement learning, to keep that in memory to, so that it doesn't dissipate and disappear. Um, and in the old days, we used to call it cold storage training. It's like saying in January, we're going to teach you how to do the annual inventory, which we do in November. So we're going to teach it in January and in November, we expect you to have it memorized. Well, that's not real. So we, so, but if it's things that we're going to teach in January that could come up maybe in February, maybe March, April, who knows? Um, then we've got to, we've got to use some mechanism and that is space learning where we are, uh, testing people and their ability to recall. Now, too often we use testing methods that are recognition, um, multiple choice. I can recognize that the answer is B or C. That, that doesn't reinforce my memory of the correct answer as much as recall, recalling from my memory rather than recognizing which is the correct answer. And so, if we're really trying to do that, we need to use flashcards, the equivalent of digital flashcards, um, to help me test my own ability to recall the information and to uh, strengthen those memories. Great. That's a very clear answer. That's some new things for me. <laughs> um, the next question is, um, you, you, you already talked a little bit about it. Um, um, in the beginning of the interview. So um, how can learners um, motivation be influenced? <clears throat> so it's, I, I know it's a really broad question. Well, um, this is this is really a, a key issue here, motivation. So um, what what I had learned way back in the early days was that um, uh, and there was a there was a joke, and it's not politically correct, but I will use it anyway. The the late Bob Mager, who is quite famous in the, Robert F. Mager, uh, is quite famous in in learning circles and training circles going back mm -hmm. into the 60s. Um, he used to joke, well, if you put a gun to their head, could they do it? And if they could, but they haven't been doing it, and you think you need to retrain them. You, you can uncover the fact that it's not the fact that they don't know how, it's just that they won't. And you've got to get to the root of why is it that they don't. So motivation is something that is personal to the individual. And if we have people who are not motivated to learn the job, 
Now, I may not be motivated to take your learning because your e-learning is just garbage. It requires far transfer. I can't see how it relates. I can't see how I'm going to apply it. So I'm not motivated to take any more of that. You know, I'm, I'll get through it as quickly as I can and just to be done with it. But I can't, I'm not motivated to learn it because I've what I've learned is that your learning isn't authentic enough. It doesn't really prepare me. But if people don't aren't willing to aren't motivated to learn, that's really a recruiting and selection systems issue and not a learning and development systems issue. And so we may need to be more careful and work with the people that do recruiting and selection of people into jobs to make sure that those people are motivated to learn. Because if they're not, then we can waste a lot of shareholder equity trying to bring them up the learning and performance curves when they really don't care. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's, so we've really got to have people who are motivated to learn, are willing to put in the effort because learning is difficult. It's not easy most of the time. And so we need those kinds of people. And then we need to make sure that what we give them for learning doesn't waste their time on nonsense uh, and things that are irrelevant. And we need to help people really master the performance requirements that they have back on the job. And if, again, if they don't understand those, what those are. Um, and so that's, again, what, what an advanced organizer, a set of advanced organizers can do for people is help them understand the job, understand that they can hurt themselves and others if they do step C poorly. Yeah, how bad? Well, you could lose an arm. Okay, well, now I'm motivated to learn that because who yeah. wants to lose an arm? And so, so we can work with people who are motivated. And if we're dealing with people who aren't motivated, it could be because they were hired, not motivated, or they have learned that, that our learning isn't really going to prepare them. And so we need to be careful about uh, uh, painting with a broad brush. Learners aren't motivated. Well, maybe they are motivated. They just learn that your stuff is garbage. And mm -hmm. so why bother? You know, so and I've had I've been in conversations with clients over the decades about that because their training sucked and and they didn't they didn't appreciate that that's how the the learner populations and the managers of the learners they all concluded that your stuff is garbage and so let's just get through it as quickly as possible and then we can get to the real learning back on the job. Okay, I think I think. That's you have a valid point, right? <laughs> um, so um, I have a few closing questions uh, for this interview. Um, and um, there's no wrong answer here or right answer, right? Uh, so how do you uh, um, envision the future of learning transfer within uh, within or without instructional engine or in general? Uh, how do I look at the future of learning transfer? I think it's going to continue to be an issue and that's unfortunate uh, but if this was true the the gurus back in 1979 had been complaining about this for at least 15 years when i first heard their complaints about this but it's because we don't do an adequate analysis we do poor design and development we don't handle uh transfer issues well and then we don't do what what attend to what's been called the maintenance of behavior because behavior will dissipate over time uh skills that aren't practiced will dissipate and so we need to do what in, whether that's space learning or through some other mechanism you know we do fire drills in school to prepare for an eventual fire even though there's no fire but we still practice with that because that's important and we need to but, but it's it's not that the learning and development professionals uh, don't know better. It's that our clients don't know better. Um, and because they come from an educational realm where we just ask people to read things and listen to lectures and then take a quiz or a test, and then we're done. They don't, they, they're not thinking about this in, in a different context here where we need people to practice what they're learning in an authentic environment building the competence and confidence that people need in order to go back to the jobs and be successful. Mm -hmm. And our clients are sometimes too far removed from that work and they don't know what's tricky and they don't know what's difficult and they don't know what's unpleasant. They may have heard some things, but they don't really know it. 
well enough to see that that practice is really key in preparing for successful transfer. But then back at the job, there's other barriers that people might face. They're under time pressures, uh, so they begin to take shortcuts despite the training. It's the same thing that people in the safety worlds and the quality worlds have been struggling with, is that people look for the least res res path of least, least mm -hmm. resistance and what's easiest, especially when they're under extreme pressures to get the job done as soon as possible. And then if there's, if there's no counterbalance to that, like a supervisor saying, guys, slow down, do that correctly, let's be safe, guy might go too quickly and be unsafe. And so this is, goes back to human nature, and this goes back to our collaboration with our clients, having them understand the reality of that performance situation and, and what they need to do to help ensure the, the, the transfer happens appropriately uh, and, and that the performance improvements that you might see, that they're maintained over time. So you would say that we should uh, inform them about this, the issues to get what, which can happen potentially? Yes, they ought, they ought to know. And again, this goes back to you can bring back valid data about that, but it may not be credible. Well, who told you that? Mm -hmm. so, so we need to be collaborating with them from the very beginning of our projects. Now, as a consultant, I've worked on you know major initiatives and, and things of with high stakes, high risks, high rewards. And if if some practitioner is working on something that isn't high stakes, it's medium stakes or it's low stakes, low risk, low reward, then you're not going to get the clients to work with you to see all these realities. Um, and, and our own L&D management may not see it and see, see that some of the things that should be done are necessary. And so this, this makes it difficult for the individual practitioner to deal with their own management and their clients. And, um, and so that's one of the decisions they have to make is where do I make a stand? Where do I you know, fight for doing something correctly? versus just doing something to get done with it. So the the saying is, is this the hill to die on? Is this the project to make a stand and insist mm -hmm. and make a lot of noise or not? And that's tough for individual practitioners who may or may not have the support of their own leadership uh, in dealing with clients and customers. It, it's, it's not an easy situation. So what does the future hold? It's kind of bleak much like if you were to look at the past. So we're dealing with human nature and that's just difficult. I think uh, I think human nature is really, really difficult. <laughs> um, so the last question I have you, Guy, uh, do you have any additional remarks or insight that you'd like to promote or share? So I, I've written a, a book about this uh, recently here about uh, transfer and I, while I was writing it, I remember that I used to bring, I, I meet with my stakeholders after the project planning and kickoff phase and show them the project plan and get them to bless it or change it or whatever. Then I meet with them after the analysis and I meet with them after the design. Then I meet with them after the pilot testing. So I have generally four meetings with my clients and stakeholder groups. And I would bring up transfer in the very first meeting. And I would, I would, I would worry out loud about transfer and they would say, what are you worried about that for? We haven't even, you know, you haven't even done your analysis and your design and all this other stuff that we hate. You haven't even done that. Why are you worried about transfer now? And I said, well, I always am worried about transfer because why are you hiring me to do this? And then if I produce something that really could be good, but isn't because it didn't transfer, well, that's no good and that's not going to be good for you and your business and your numbers and your bonuses always bring up the money um and yeah. and so uh, i i needed them to know that i was worried about and so they would start to worry about trans and then and then at, after analysis i would say well this is what we've uncovered this is what we think might be some of the barriers to transfer later on and they would begin to worry with me a little bit more 
And then we would do our design and say, here's the design of the instruction. And here's the design for the for what we need to give to the supervisor and or the peers or whoever else we think you know we need to attend to. And they would look at that and go, well, we don't want to spend money on that, do we? I mean, we want to. And so they would they would have to b- become concerned with this. And more often than not, I've had and I've had a lot of clients tell me over the years, you know, we thought you were crazy worrying about transfer, but now we see it. We worry about it ourselves. And now we're going to bring the hammer down and tell everybody they got to do this and we're going to expect it. and We're going to bring the hammer down on them if they don't help us make this transition from the current state to that future state. And so and that was my goal uh, to somewhat manipulate them into becoming aware that it's a potential issue in the first place. And maybe it's not. Okay, then we just drop it. But maybe we get reinforced and find out, yeah, there are these barriers. There are supervisors out there who have heard about this newfangled way of doing things and they don't like it already. They don't even know what it is, but they know they don't like it. Because people, even though we change all the time, we, we, we resist change that's imposed on us. And but and so we so I think that that's one of the things is that you've got to help your clients begin to anticipate what the potential barriers are to get them thinking about this themselves. Because if this was a worthy effort to undertake and spend the time and the money and people, people, they're the executives time on these kinds of things, then they got to see that we're all together trying to make this change to affect this performance in a way. And we need to be on the lookout for anything that could impede our progress, inhibit our progress, stop it dead cold, and do something about it earlier, sooner rather than later. And and so sometimes it's just asking some of the questions like, well, what do you think the, some of the barriers might be? And, and, they might, and they might say, well, there won't be any, because they haven't thought about it well enough yet. And we need to get them to start thinking about it early in the project. Um, and it's just a subtle thing too. So you can't just, you know, blurt out in front of a client meeting, you know, what about transfer? What are we going to worry about the barriers? Uh, you, the timing is everything and and how we put it is critical in working collaboratively with our clients. And so there's a time and a place to bring these things up. Maybe it's in private, maybe it's in a group forum. As always, it depends. And so that's that's part of the trickiness of dealing with people and dealing with people who are your clients. Um, and as clients, you know, he who uh, pays the piper calls the tune. And so we are working for them for their own good. And if they understand that that's what we're doing, we're trying to look out for them. Mm-hmm. Um, then I think that they'll be more open to investigating and thinking a little bit more about some of these issues. Okay. Well, that was my last question. Um, Thank you very much for your uh, insights and um, your time to do this interview. I'm more than happy to do it. And thank you for agreeing to uh, record this so that we can share this with others. Of course. (laughs)